turn on the monoliths. If okay, still the stream there. has started. Let's see who accepts I it. I think they've already left. Okay. Is my guess. Okay, Facebook has accepted the stream. Let's see if YouTube accepts the stream. Twitch has accepted the stream. Now mm. let's see if YouTube does. And YouTube has accepted the stream. Okay, so. So people can see us on Facebook. That's um, LaDesia there. I am yes. going yeah. to now. Um, Hi, LaDesia. And, and you're going to send me the. I'm going to send you right. the link. Yep, text me the link. But I want to put the timer up on the screen so I don't forget to do that. Mm -hmm. There it is. And then if you're putting, you know, you don't need to put it on, but you could if you put, it's going to be talking piece war made invisible. Okay. And that, yeah. Yeah. In other words, you don't want the comments? You want. No, or just, no, let's have the comments. Okay. Then. Yeah. All right. Do you really want the comments in the stream? When we okay, or not. Then yeah. it's up okay, to you. Go back. I mean, yeah, let's okay. just put them in. Some go shows, back to some the shows name of the want show. them on and yeah, some we'll, shows don't. We'll, we'll put them because we have no idea <laughs> right. who's out there. Yeah. So um, You want me to put text up instead? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just talking piece colon war made invisible. That's a theory, anyway. Well, it's something that I'm, I would uphold that theory, 100%. 100%. I think this is a protocol. Just try to scare the guests away. And those who hang around, we know we're going to have a great show. Right, exactly. <laughs> And then I'm going to shut off the comments. There we go. Is that how you want it? Just like that, Vicki? Great. Thanks. I spell everything correctly? Yeah. Okay, should I send you the link now? Please. Okay, we will do. And then we go to... And Facebook is giving me the link. And Great. Now I'm going to send it to you through a text message. Is that yep. okay? Please. Okay.
Mike, do you need the link for anything? No. Okay. Mm -mm. The link has been sent, Vicki. Voila. Very good. Thank you. And... Okay, so... We're ready to roll. Okay. Okay. Oh, and I'll turn I'll my the ringer up. off. If you, any phone ringers can be turned off. Just, And I'm ready if you are. Okay. I'm getting ready to put the... <laughs> okay, there it is. All right, let's see. Boom. Do you want to put our names underneath our boxes? Or No. No. Okay. That's so they don't... It'll take even longer. That's yeah. Why. Yeah. What? What? What was your suggestion? No, that we go ahead. That's my suggestion. Okay. <laughs> They'll figure out that we're all not. There's your timer. Okay. You ready? Okay. When it says on the air, you're on the air. Wonderful. Welcome to Talking Peace with the Western New York Peace Center, being recorded here at Think Twice Radio in the home of the future, also the home of our friend and producer, Richard Wicca. Wicca. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to our friends at Buff State, WBNY, Buffalo's original alternative radio station at 91.3 FM. Thank you, Buff State and WBNY. And when I think of thankfulness, I think about people who have been so oppressed. Um, I think about our indigenous friends and, and people who have suffered enslavement who, despite what they've gone through, We'll start with thankfulness. Start with remembering what's important. So um, in that vein, we like to think, as, as the Haudenosaunee start off with a, uh, uh, a gnonio, a thankful, the Thanksgiving address, we usually start off just remembering Mother Earth and all of the, the living waters, the, the Haudenosaunee, call, say, mini Wachone, water is life. Think of the, all the plants, the animals, the mountains, and the, the sun and the moon and the stars. So many things that make this a beautiful world here that we can have a good life in this creation. And our creator and, and the love that makes all that go around. And so on that note, they would say Nyawe here in, in on, on Haudenosaunee land, Seneca land, they would say Nyawe, and then the people would say Nyo. So I would say Nyawe and Nyo. Nyo. Thank you so much. Um, we're so excited about this show. So we, this is a very important show um, in so many ways, and we're just thrilled to have, uh, uh, well, the, our topic of um, War Made Invisible and such a such a such uh, an erudite and clear-minded, clear-thinking, and uh, clear-writing individual who wrote the book, War Made Invisible, Norman Solomon. Norm, welcome. Thanks so much. Very good to be with you. Oh, we're thrilled that you could make it, and we're sorry that um, we'll, we'll have you on audio only for those the people who are watching this on video, um, and for those of you who are on radio, you won't know the difference. <laughs> And, of course, we're also very excited that here we have Mike Nyman. Um, Mike is a professor at Buff State and a media, media studies professor. Mike, welcome. Thank you. And, uh, Norm, I, I, it's, you know, in our description of show, there's so many things that you've done, which includes, you know, everything from your many books your, um, your, and your tremendous work on trying to get the media, you know, to to have fairness and accuracy in reporting, which is about the last thing we do 
in terms of war. So we're going to get into that. But before we do, I want to say um, if we could go around and when we think, we like to start off with looking at values. So when we think of this topic of how war is made invisible, um, if we could just uh, do like a go round on values. So I'm going to ask, um, actually, uh, I'll ask you, Norm, if you would start um, with what you what values do you think of in connection with this issue? In terms of values, whether it's the professional job of journalists to report and analyze, or whether really the rest of us, we need single standards. We should not, at least we suffer from, uh, when there is a bouncing around what George Orwell called doublethink, where there are certain standards and then they're thrown overboard into the wake, dumped overboard when it's not convenient. And so, for instance, if we are saying in the context of war that it is absolutely wrong for one country to invade another country and start killing people for some ostensible good reason, then that should apply. Whether the invasion is perpetrated against Ukraine or Iraq or Afghanistan, if slaughtering of civilians is wrong, then that is a human standard, and it's wrong uh, whether Russia is doing it in Ukraine or Israel is doing it in Gaza. Right. You're so right. And and that really is really the crux of this book. I mean, it comes through loud and clear and in so much of your other work as well. Um, Mike, are there some values you want to mention? Um, I, I think Norm really articulated the values that those of us who call ourselves journalists should certainly adhere to, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, I like Amy Goodman's way of putting it. She once, you know, uh, she says it lots of times, but I think the uh, first time I heard it from her, she's saying just, uh, thank you for going to where the darkness is, you know, and uh, that's the most important job of a journalist is to find the things that are going on in the world that we all as humans need to know about so that we can act if necessary. So, I mean, as much as we talk about disinformation and misinformation, at the foundational core of disinformation and misinformation is no information. And right. that, you know, how can you be a journalist when you're ignoring the biggest stories that are out there because they're inconvenient for your career right, or your continued employment? So, yeah, I mean, just disappointed in journalists. That's why um, I really appreciate, you know, Norm's book focusing on, you know, who is the ones who are being silent, making this invisible. Right, right. Well, you're, you're right along. Um, I know you've both been working on this in so many ways about propaganda and persuasion, which I know you teach, Mike. Um, and and it's been throughout your all of your work is either explicitly or implicitly, uh, Norm, uh, those, well, I'd say the principles of truth and love. And I, you know, I, I often, those are the principles I think of because I think of Dr. King saying, you know, that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. And the thing about truth is back to, um, you know, the truth of what's actually going on, not shading it, not not reframing it, and back to, you know, bringing it up, those truths that people want to ignore. And then it's done in love because people are paying the price in so many different ways, so very many ways. So, so it's, it, and especially where war is concerned, although, you know, corruption and other things, you know, have heavy price too. And they're also back to this, intimately connected to the, the war machine and, and the war being a racket, as, as General Smedley Butler said. So, so, um, so let us start with really getting into, uh, let's move to go, really getting into the book. And um, Norm, if you would, if you would just um, tell us a little bit about how it came about that you um, wrote this, you know, what made you think to write it and, and precipitated it, and what is the main thing you want people to get out of it? 
I'd written an earlier book that came out uh, a couple of years after the invasion of Iraq. So we're talking around 2007. And it was titled War Made Easy. Right. And I thought um, a number of years after that, uh, really during the Trump administration, so much had happened in the previous dozen years or so. What would be a follow up? And first I thought, well, more War Made Easy might be a title. As I really molded over, I thought that the presence, even the superficial presence in media of U.S. wars uh, had been dissipating and that less and less were they visible. U.S. troops were not involved. There was more and more long-range use of missiles, drones, bombing, Mm -hmm. secretive activities. And so this reality of invisibility came more to... I think, uh, encapsulate what the hell has been going on. Uh, the U.S. military budget's gone on and on. The mm-hmm. myth is that the U.S. is not in, in war anymore or has been the myth. Uh, President Biden went to the U.N. in the fall of 2021 and said in the wake of the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, we've turned a page. The U.S. is no longer at war. And at that time, the Cost of War Project at Brown University documented that the U.S. was involved in some form of military activity and so-called counterinsurgency in 85 countries. Well, that's sort of a gap. <laughs> the U.S. 85. is no, no longer at war, uh, but uh, we're engaged in dozens of dozens of countries. And, of course, since 2021, the U.S. has more and more been in, involved with missile strikes uh, in Africa, in Syria, Iraq, and that to me was an important way of raising not only the question of the invisibility of war as an activity, but also the perennial question of who is acknowledged as being important and who isn't. Right. And you can go uh, to neighborhoods in Buffalo, to places in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere, and with some exceptions, the mass media tacitly assume that some people's lives just don't matter right. and other people's matter just a lot. Right. And so a theme running through the War Made Invisible book is that essentially we have what I call two tiers of grief. Mm-hmm. That's spelled T-I-E-R-S, although it could be spelled another way. Mm-hmm. And that is people whose grief matters and grief that doesn't matter. And this is so pernicious, so <laughs> constant that we often don't give it a second thought. We were talking a few minutes ago about a single standard, I think a single standard of war and what is not acceptable, Mm -hmm. a single standard of human rights. Mm -hmm. And we've seen since the book um, has come out last summer that in the last six plus months, this has really come into play again, where studies done by the Intercept Media Outlet, done by Fairness and Accuracy Reporting, have shown that uh, U.S. media coverage of the horrendous attack on Israelis by Hamas last October 7th, and in comparison to that, the coverage in the six months afterwards of the Israeli military actions in Gaza have really been qualitatively very different in terms of being emotive, in terms of using words like slaughter and brutal and atrocity, And again, with some exceptions, but when you do a content analysis, you see that overwhelmingly, whether it's the New York Times or the Buffalo News or elsewhere, Mm -hmm. you see that the killing of the maiming of Israelis is taken much more seriously than the killing and maiming of Palestinians. And whether it's, of course, the activism that's been going on through the Peace Center in Buffalo or the concerns, the deep concerns that people have around the country and elsewhere, we're saying no. We're saying yes to life affirmation that everybody's lives matter. And we're saying that it is unacceptable for the U.S. military budget now uh, up to very close to one trillion with a T dollars a year is devoted to not only directly uh, killing people in many countries with drone strikes and elsewhere, which is still going on, but fundamentally the arming of many regimes around the country. The U.S. uh, spends uh, more on its military than the next 10 countries combined, and most of those countries are allies. And so it's a tremendous imbalance. And just in the last few days, with very few exceptions, 
um, most of the members of Congress voted to send 17 billion with the B dollars to Israel while we know, if we want to know, that those weapons are being used to kill vast numbers of civilians. According to the best data, 15,000 children have been killed courtesy of U.S. taxpayers in the last six months. Again, what are the standards? And if we're going to have a single standard, then that means that whether we're journalists or anybody else, we would say we're not going to use Orwellian doublethink and say some people matter, they matter, and then they don't matter because it's not convenient. Right. Or yeah, some people matter, but the other people matter more. No, or right. they, they don't even matter because, as you said, they don't even bring it up. So, you know, people say, why didn't you, you know, why aren't you talking about October 7th? You know, when people are saying for a ceasefire. Well, October 7th, first of all, what didn't happen in a vacuum. However, that was, you know, we're talking a fraction. And back to what you said about you know, that set a different a standard. I want to say there is so much information, and this is a topic that I'm very interested in. So I've read a lot of the data, you know, and ha I know some of those numbers, the 10, you know, depending on how you're counting, but the next 10, you know, countries in the world, you know, spending about the same as what the, the U.S. spends. And, and when you say, you think of the rest of the countries, their their military budgets are so small anyway that of course they're it's not even you know a, the vast majority is U.S. is U.S. military spending and that doesn't even include all of the military associated spending, but I just want to hold up your book, and I just want to say you know the subtext how America hides the human toll of its military machine. So there's a lot of, there's a lot packed in there. And I want to say the human toll, especially as you so point out, you know, that uh, that some people's deaths are ignored and others are are emphasized, are broadcast. Well, looking, I mean, yeah, looking and we can't, you know, we really can't talk about this subject without talking about what's going on in Gaza and the occupied right. territories in Israel, right. because that's the horror that we see every day, right. at least those who are looking for that information we see every day. Right. But um, yeah, we have to be careful not to, you know, not to try to put this into, into ratios, ratios of horror and ratios of atrocities, but just that horrific atrocities have happened, right. you know, in Israel and are now happening and ongoing in Gaza. Right. And I think the focus on Gaza is because that is where the horror is ongoing at the moment, exactly. but also in the representation of that horror. Uh, I don't know the current count, and it's just going to be obsolete probably by the end of today or tomorrow as to how many journalists have died in Gaza. And you have Israel controlling the security situation in Israel, and Israel now controlling the security situation in Gaza, and Israeli hands on the deaths of probably most of the journalists, uh, very safely, most of the journalists who died in, in Gaza, that uh, when the horror was in Israel, the international press had easy access to it. And right now it seems to be an objective of the war. And it's not just you know Israel and Gaza. You know We've seen this in a lot of wars in the last 20 years or so, whereby journalists who once had access to battlefields don't have access to battlefields. In particular, you know, the more human rights uh, violations, the more dangerous it is for a journalist to work. And so it's, yeah, it's right now it's extraordinarily dense. We need to really, um, you know, we need to really uh, appreciate, especially the citizen journalists in Gaza who are the only ones right. getting this story out right now. So. It's, yeah, it's what's going on here in the American press, but it's also how Israel is controlling the narrative by um, controlling which journalists get to live. And, and, what, and you know, one, yeah. whether yeah. information is getting out. Yeah. You, know, you know, one aspect uh, that you're touching on among, you know, very important, the last statistics I've seen from the Committee to Protect Journalists, it's over 100 journalists have been killed uh, in Gaza 
And the Committee to Protect Journalists is a very, if you will, establishment organization. And they say point blank that Israel has a history of intentionally killing journalists. Mm -hmm. This is just a reality. And we have a history here that is largely ignored by the, ironically and sadly enough, even by U.S. journalists. We rarely uh, hear that reported or noted more broadly the deception that has come from the Israeli government has often been taken at face value by the U.S. press. There's a classic uh, book called The First Casualty by Philip Knightley. Mm -hmm. It's been around for a few decades, uh, taken from the aphorism, which is true, that the first casualty of war is truth. Right. And we're seeing this again and again. I've been, for the last several months, working on a afterward for War Made Invisible that is totally about the Gaza war. Mm -hmm. And as is true for so, so many people, it's been extremely distressing to me to in real time monitor the mechanisms that have enabled, to give an example, members of Congress to acknowledge that Israel is doing terrible condemnable things in Gaza and slaughtering civilians and then turn around and vote for billions of dollars of more military aid, taxpayer money from the U.S., further providing the wherewithal for the Israeli government to continue to do what they're doing. It is classic sort of Orwellian doublethink. And one quick example, there was a laudable effort by uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland yes. to go to the border where the Israeli military was blocking the incoming food and other supplies while people were literally starving just on the other side of the border. And in February, Senator Van Hollen came to the Senate floor and he said, and th these are these are words he used, war criminals, that the Israeli government is being run by war criminals who are engaging in the war crime of intentionally starving civilians as a strategy of war. A few hours after he made that very moving speech, mm -hmm. Senator Van Hollen voted for many billions of dollars more, really? $14 billion more of U.S. weapons to Israel. So this is a disconnect that uh, we are faced with. Wow. It, it, it's, it's just horrendous. One of the things that I, I want to bring up, international law. So, and even our local, our, our, our uh, federal U.S. laws. So, of course, in the Supremacy Clause, it says that all of our treaties and, uh, and international agreements are the supreme law of the land. And the war crimes that are being done are, well, first of all, it doesn't even have to be proved that they're war crimes. It's to be credibly, uh, uh, credible evidence of, of the possibility of war crimes should stop us from being able to arm a country. That's what our laws say. That's the, that, those are the U.S. laws, the Leahy Law or the Leahy Amendment, and, um, and other laws that are, are, are similar and yet it's happening. So it makes me think of, actually, Daniel Ellsberg and some of the work that you've done, which I consider this, this is whistleblowing, really, in a way. I mean, not from within, mm -hmm. but from without. But, you know, sounding the alarm for the things that people don't know, should know, or are, are conveniently ignoring. So, you know, the fact that we have 750 at least um, bases around the world. Well, I, actually, I knew that, and lots of people don't know that. But what I didn't know was, tell me again, how few any of the other countries have. That's in here. Uh, it's, what, what is it again? Yes, very, very, very relatively small. I was just looking at these stats. By some estimates, Russia has about 15 overseas right. bases. Right. The, the vast num majority of the overseas military bases in the world are U.S. bases, and we know about, for instance, 
the Monroe Doctrine, which has been cited often for the U.S., and you mm-hmm. mentioned earlier, Vicki Smedley Butler, mm-hmm. you know, racketeer for capitalism, right. he said, as a Marine general, mm-hmm. intervention in Nicaragua and elsewhere. This concept has been worse than problematic, the Monroe Doctrine, but that's not enough now. Right. One hemisphere is just not enough. We hear that the Chinese government is so pernicious and dangerous. They have their warships in the South China Sea. We don't hear any mention. Hmm. Why does the South China Sea have as its middle name China? Oh, well, hey, it's right next to China. (laughs) I mean, can you imagine if the Chinese government said, oh, what is the U.S. having any of its warships in the Caribbean. That's not right. I mean, we would think they were crazy. It, it's, it's just incredible. It's, it's just, it's almost unbelievable. And it, it makes me think of, um, you know, just all the, the, the principles of propaganda that you just say that, you know, there's the blinders. It's a combination of the blinders on so that people either don't realize or they don't want to realize or, you know, I mean, how much doesn't get uh, uh, revealed? Another thing that you you write of so so movingly in here is the the difference in the reporting between, you know, in in what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq versus Ukraine. So the 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 the, the heart wrenching stories, or for our own losses with nine eleven, the difference in reporting. So the, the reporters have to know, they have to see, or maybe they don't see, but they're just not, they're not able to get there. Or if they are, they're embedded with the troops. So they only get this limited vision and it's made very convenient for them to not bring up the, the terrible, the terrible toll that our being the greatest purveyor of violence in the world is bringing upon the world. And the greatest um, war uh, uh, profiteer. Well, that's a phrase you use that, of course, is from Martin Luther King's speech at mm-hmm. Riverside Church on right. April 4th, 1967, and mm-hmm. the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Right. It's actually true of the 21st century. The U.S. has set the pace with the invasion of Afghanistan and mm-hmm. Iraq and so forth, mm-hmm. which does not justify what Russia is doing no. um, in uh, Ukraine, of course. But it has set a tone and it has normalized and has made uh, more destructive the ambience in the world toward any sort of international order that makes sense. Mm -hmm. People will probably remember hearing from uh, Antony Blinken, Secretary of State, and even President Biden. They say the United States wants a world-based, wants a rule-based order, a rules-based order which is really sort of laughable uh, in a grim, sad way, because Mm -hmm. the real meaning of that is we make the rules and we break the rules. If we want to invade a country, we do it. If we're okay with Israel doing what it wants to do in Gaza, killing civilians, sometimes into the hundreds per day, uh, no problem. But we're going to go around preaching a rules-based order. And we know this in personal terms, but it's true in international terms. People do not take seriously when they hear, do as we say, not as we do. Well, that's some of the collateral damage from what's going on in Gaza. And, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there are no winners if you're looking at Israel and, you know, the Palestinians. No. Or Israel and Hamas. Um, Israel, if, if there's been any success in destroying something, um, Netanyahu's government seems to be destroying the very concept of Israel. Right. But uh, who's the winner of this war? This would be actually, you know, the Russians. Because, or Hal Burton and right, well, Hal Hal Burton. Burton. That, goes, I mean, that goes without saying. I mean, that's not, the, yeah, the, yeah, the war contract is... That, the war contract. That, that's that's yeah. obvious. That goes without saying. Right, right. But, um, you know, uh, things were very, very difficult propaganda-wise for the Russians, um, to really justify what was going on in Ukraine until suddenly there's something that is seemingly exponentially more horrific, right. whereby in comparison, 
it looks like the Russians are being somewhat measured, you know, in that they, even though they've taken down, you know, blocks of apartment buildings and, and theaters and, you know, churches and so on, you know, uh, there's, you know, Gaza looks like Dresden, and Gaza looks like Hiroshima, right. you know. Right. So suddenly, with all of the horror coming from Gaza, you know, what's going on in Ukraine has become, okay, we're going into, you know, year three, and suddenly it seems to be, like, balanced and well-behaved when it is, in of itself, a house of horrors. So this distraction, this other shiny object, has worked out really well for Russian propaganda machines. And, you know, so, you know, because our, you know, our level of what it takes to horrify us has, has, has gone up. Right. And that, you know, journalism-wise, you know, this rush to kind of excuse Israel's actions in Gaza also certainly excuse Russia's actions in Ukraine. So the Western media which was working in lockstep, rightfully so, to expose the horrors in Ukraine, you know, are now essentially excusing them by excusing what are clearly even greater horrors in Gaza. So it's a total collapse of journalism globally. Right. Right. Well, I think that's true, and it's also been a collapse of any moral standing that yes. the U.S. Right. government and the Biden administration had one example, uh, just in terms of Ukraine, was people may recall when the invasion by Russia began, there was publicity about the use of cluster munitions, which are some of the worst weapons mm -hmm. uh, in existence in terms of so-called conventional usage. And uh, the White House suggested it might be a war crime that Russia was using cluster munitions in Ukraine. A year later, the supplies of other kinds of bombs had really dwindled. There was a shortage. The factories in Ukraine and the U.S. couldn't keep up. And so the Biden administration approved sending massive quantities of cluster munitions to Ukraine so they could be used by the U.S. government, by the U.S. government's uh, financing and provision by the Ukrainians. So we're really in, or in an Orwellian world. And unfortunately, while it was noted in, in news media, it's sort of a passing um, event. And as I, I mentioned in War Made Invisible in the first chapter, repetition is the essence of propaganda and omission or rare mention is the opposite. Right. No, you're so right. And that is such a big part of it, the part that goes unspoken. You know, and actually that's one of the things I'm getting out of this. Well, and out of War Made Invisible for that matter, and also as we're talking. But it, it, it's also making me think of um, the, the Merchants of Death Tribunal and the amount of money that's being made. So one of the things, you know, I sometimes I, I call it Fear, Inc., that is the, um, all the efforts to control, intimidate, incarcerate, or even kill. They are the ones who get all the money. So these are the people behind a gun of some kind or, or you know, force that are mostly the military contractors and so the military industrial complex and congressional and media and all the bought in things including the sheriff's department I mean speaking locally you know the carceral system and the police department all that they get all the resources and they are making money but then we don't have money for taking care of people, for health care, for education, for infrastructure, for, for um, doing something about the collapse of our, 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 our climate, you know, our, our climate catastrophe going on. Um, so those war profiteers that are, you know, Lockheed Martin, uh, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, um, Raytheon, and, and General Dynamics, are, are raking in the dough, and I, I, we've done a show with, with uh, Brad. In fact, you were, you were supposed to be on the show. for the, We didn't manage to make that show happen with you, but we did do a, a show or even a couple shows on that War Profiteers, um, the Merchants of Death Tribunal that is still going on. People can sign up and get those 
evidentiary videos, and they will, that tribunal will be coming up with a determination. Well, speaking of merchants of death, um, you mentioned, I believe, that Northrop Grumman has a office in the Buffalo area. Mm-hmm. Two of them, and, yeah. Wow, two. And uh, those outposts are significant. I was lucky enough to get to know Daniel Ellsberg and his last book, The Doomsday Machine, talks about ICBMs, and they're actually the very worst and most dangerous nuclear weapons land-based, as he explains. And Northrop Grumman is the big contractor for uh, the current appropriations. So this is a this is a company that exists uh, for profit to maximize profit, and along the way, it's it's helping to move the world closer to uh, global annihilation, which is not cool, right? Uh, we could say. Right. So I'm very encouraged that Daniel Ellsberg Week is moving forward. It's going to straddle the week that is the first anniversary of when Daniel Ellsberg passed away. And I'm excited that people around the country are going to do actions at places like Northrop Grumman offices picket congressional offices in local districts. It's a way not only to honor Dan Ellsberg for what he did during his 52 years of life after releasing the Pentagon Papers, it's also a way of saying that we don't want this world to be annihilated and we're not going to passively just watch it happen. So I'm just wondering, I I think you must be on our resist militarism email chain or something like that because you're exactly on where we are with the planning (laughs) because we are going to be observing Daniel Ellsberg week. We're very excited to do that this year. And his passing last year is just heartbreaking. His life of, of, of service and courage is just amazing. And actually, but what made me bring up whistleblowers um, before was because I was thinking about it in connection with him. And, and that's why I was thinking of it in connection with you. And in fact, you, you talk about Daniel Ellsberg at the very end of this book. Um, because, and he, he was such a courageous and, and such, a, such a clear thinking, courageous and loving man. What an amazing man. So we are going to remember him by doing our own whistleblowing, by going to Northrop Grumman that week and um, putting them on notice that they're breaking, you know, they're breaking our U.S. laws, at least three of uh, three, uh, at least six of them. And uh, besides international law and that, you know, it has to stop and we'll see, you know, exactly how we're going to let them know that. That's all in process, but we'll be going. Well, those kind of actions are so important. And the pretense from these companies and their uh, top executives is that they don't care about these actions. They really do. Mm -hmm. It's a very hazardous thing for their status quo when people get out there and nonviolently raise hell. Well, that's our plan. So we'll be ready. You're welcome to come out. I bet you'll be pretty busy that week, though. That's I will be, be there in spirit. There'll be a busy week all around. I hope that, yeah, all around, all the, all over the country, because he, he, he. It's a perfect time and way to remember, recognize, and try to channel some of that truth and love. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm I, actually I was hoping that we might talk about that. The other thing I wanted to, to hear you talk about is um, is um, oh the costs that, that some of some more of the hidden costs like what this does for the trajectory both for our um, our social services and and our domestic needs as well as for our um, our society and what's happening to our culture and our communities. Well, Martin Luther King Jr. referred to the massive military spending, and I'm quoting here, mm-hmm. a demonic destructive suction tube, taking money, siphoning the resources away from health care, education, housing, so much else that we need to sustain and nurture life. And, uh, as in 1967, when he talked about it, 
uh, that's where we are in 2024, whether it's, uh, you know, upstate New York or Southern California or anywhere right. else in this country. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's, you know, uh, even Eisenhower said, you know, every, every uh, aircraft carrier is, is a theft from every hungry family. And and actually, this is this is why I love. We have a Veterans for Peace chapter that is slowly growing and maybe now quickly growing here in Western New York, Chapter One Twenty Eight. But the veterans do know if they allow themselves to know, you know, which some people are, um, either, you know, I. I but it, it, anyway, Veterans for Peace is so clear about the way that that we're all paying a price. And certainly the people who are, who are making the war, the warriors, the, and especially drone pilots, are paying a tremendous price. They've seen that, that um, the traumatic stress of being a drone pilot is worse than being boots on the ground. And that's what's happening with so much of our, of our, um, our war making, as you also talk about in here. That there's there's so much of it. It's the armchair war, well armchair warriors. It's people at there, and then they've they've found this way of dispersing the responsibility. Just like, you know, for for um, actually for capital punishment, so that no one feels they're the one who's doing it. You know, everybody has a different piece of it. But the trauma for drone pilots is incredible when they, they, see, they follow the people, then they see them blown, blown up like that, and then they go home and, and have lunch with their family. Yeah, it's interesting talking to veterans about that. Um, and I certainly don't know firsthand about war. But, you know, as best as I can understand, if you're boots on the ground and somebody's shooting at you, so you always have that I am defending myself, mm-hmm. you know, rationale going on, which actually might be very true mm-hmm. eventually. Why you're on the ground is a whole different story, but right. once you're there. Right. Whereas, you know, if you're sitting on the other side of the planet or you're sitting a thousand miles away or you're sitting in an office and you're not being physically threatened, but you are more effectively, you know, targeting and killing people, then you have actually the luxury of comfort uh, which allows you the space to think about what's going on around you and to think rationally. So it's, I find it very helpful that people are having such difficulty doing this because um, that goes to what the non-killing anthropologists argue that we are really evolutionarily wired to not kill right. because societies that were violent uh, you know, where there was a lot of killing, uh, were not conducive to being able to rear the next generation to reproductive age. So there's, and you go to the First World War, and don't quote me on the numbers, but something like around 20% of the, only 20% could actually, when they saw the, got close enough to see the opponent's eyes, could, you know, could pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, through various uh, sophisticated training and torture through training, you know, right. dehumanization um, has really been able to be increased. But, you know, having no journalistic boots on the ground, you know, means that we are not seeing the horrors of the killing. Right. At best, we're seeing the aftermath, or at best, we're seeing somebody with a, with a cell phone ducking for cover. But right. mostly what we see are ruined buildings and, and not the horror. So as, uh, you know, as humans on Earth, you know, we're not getting that human response because of how these images are packaged. You know, Norm, can I ask you, as we were just talking about the drones, to talk about, and whistleblowers, to talk about Daniel Hale? Hmm. Yes, I understand Daniel Hale has been released from prison. He had a four-year wow. sentence, and I was I was very pleased to to write about him in the book, although it's a very disgraceful record from the U.S. He was a drone whistleblower, and he provided the Intercept with a lot of information about how so many of the drone strikes from the U.S. were killing women and children and mm-hmm. other civilians, mm-hmm. and uh, they just threw the book at him. Um, there, in War Made Invisible, there's what I and many other people found a very moving letter 
that he wrote to the judge. He said, I couldn't do anything else. Right. I saw right. what was going on. Right. I sent the information because I thought the public had a right to know. Well, he's, he did such a service. And I know, you know, um, I and, and some of us here in, in upstate New York have been very involved with, um, well, whatever we want, drawing attention to the drone programs. And we certainly have one up at, in uh, Niagara Falls and in Syracuse. And um, he, he shed so much light on what that really was like. Also, Lisa Ling, who you also include in the book. Um, and just that going that direction, it's back to, you know, and this, uh, you know, what's going to happen also domestically? Because the more they say, oh, well, we don't want our, you know, to uh, put our, put our, our enlisted people in harm's way. Well, also the police. I'm sure we don't want to put them in harm's way. So there's already been a law in, uh, uh, I believe it was in uh, North Dakota or South Dakota, that um, they allow non-lethal weapons on drones. And the reason was because of Standing Rock and all, all what was going on there. But when, when I, the more militarized and the more our, our military is going around doing, doing what they're doing around the world, the more I fear for the rest of the world and our, our survival. And also in this country, it's, not, it's going to come back to bite us. It already has to a certain extent with the militarization of the police and all the, all the uh, uh, war material that's being used by police departments. Yeah, no doubt the aphorism applies. Uh, what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. The violence, as you know, in, in War Made Invisible, I write a lot about the, the violent training and then the right. increase in domestic violence, right. the use of what that the Pentagon also. calls its 1033 program to send really MRAPs and many uh, military um obviously military uh, equipment uh, aspects into the police force. As a matter of fact, um, when there were so many hundreds of Black Lives Matter protests in the streets, mm -hmm. people were facing off against military equipment from right. the Pentagon. Right. Right. So we just, uh, you know, we just can't have it. We just can't have it, have it. Um, and it's not it's, just here. It's global um, in Costa Rica, which famously supposedly does not have a military, but the U.S. started flooding them with police aid. Oh, God. So mm. that, you know, the police in Costa Rica walk around in camouflage, oftentimes carrying guns in a country that doesn't have a military, because this is the, this is the aid that we're sending. I, so. just, I just want to mention that Fear, Inc. again. Fear, mm. Inc. Cha-ching. That's where all the money goes. I don't, you know, it's just, it's just so, just so concerning. So let us move on to what people can do, what people can do to get more informed and to get more involved. So the first thing I'm going to start it right off with, buy this book. <laughs> so War, War Made Invisible is really, really great really a great book there's just so much in it so there's both the the data you know the actual facts and the numbers and the the correlations and the stories the personal stories that just make it so compelling so that this is this is excellent and i've been using it in my discussions about the topic to, to help people understand what's really going on so that's one thing. But so from the two of you, what are some of your suggestions of things people can do? Make well, I'd love to hear some suggestions about, from one standpoint, journalism. I mean, as individuals, mm -hmm. what people can do is people can make noise. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I think I, I, you know, I've been standing uh, locally with Jewish Voice for Peace. Because <laughs> I kind of feel that I don't have the luxury of not making noise. Mm -hmm. Because what Netanyahu is doing, what the Israeli government is doing, is an ex existential threat to the idea of Jewish values. Right. And um, as far as what journalists can do, uh, 
I mean, the thing is that it's what what's happening to journalism, you know, and and that right. you know, I think about the various venues, you know, that would publish my syndicated columns, and how many of them no longer exist. Mm-hmm. So you know mm-hmm. what we really need to do is we need to look at journalism as a social good. So not just what can journalists do. Um, my students in journalism tend to migrate, you know, migrate out of the uh, field when they start seeing, you know, that their fellow majors in the department who are, who are concentrating in public relations and advertising, you know, have lots of job prospects when they graduate um, that pay living wages. Uh, whereas in journalism classes, uh, one of the things we teach them is, is how to get arrested. <laughs> you know, and, and then the, the jobs seem to be fewer and far between and, and with, you know, uh, pretty low entry level wages. And then once uh, people get these entry level jobs in journalism, uh, they come back to me very frustrated, uh, not about what they do, but what they're not allowed to do and, you know, what they're discouraged from from covering. So it's a crisis in journalism, mm-hmm. and that journalism is a social good. We need to, and I say we now as like we the people, we need to be out there um, on the streets demanding a better system for funding journalism as a social good. And and then as journalists, well, I think I think right now those of us who call ourselves journalists are very privileged to be able to do so. Because so few people actually, you know, uh, get the opportunity to be a journalist. And those that do um, are mostly shackled in what they can do as a journalist. And one of the biggest problems with the kind of, you know, in- investigative reporting, which is a kind of reporting that, that you're talking about, Norman, is that it is expensive. So, because mm-hmm. it takes a lot of time. Right. You know, I, I don't have to, you know, and that, that you know, really stresses out the model by which we fund most journalism still, you know, which is a corporate model of being cost effective. And right now, uh, most, uh, you know, most people in most young people, and I'm thinking it's old people too, um, are really foregoing, you know, looking for journalistic sources and going towards a more dopaminergic, you know, social media you know entertainment because it's it's kind of you know it's kind of exciting them on a on a neurological level so whereas journalism in, involves uh facts and all the stories everything we're talking about is complicated it doesn't fit into a 20 second tiktok so and it doesn't make you it doesn't make you laugh and it doesn't make you rage or well, it does make you rage but more slowly you know so i don't know it's a, it's an existential crisis in journalism that we need to find new ways to support journalism okay so what can we do ah. <laughs> you know um we can subscribe you know and, and we can support journalistic organizations you know we can look at not for profit you know uh, organizations like locally the investigative post yes and um you know, and, and nationally, you know, pro publica and, and try to support them. Because and democracy that, now. And democracy now, because these are about, you know, the most important mm-hmm. thing. But because we live in our silos, you know, even if they're out there, most people will not, the people who need to see them won't see them. What, well, I completely agree with that. I think that assessment of uh, our journalistic status quo is is very clear and mm-hmm. is a reality that we're going to have to come to terms with. It really is a low point, I think, in our lifetimes for journalism in this country. The folding of newspapers and just the diminishment of the interest in journalism in ostensibly journalistic outlets such as daily papers. I don't need to tell you if you've got a daily paper around how it has shrunk conceptually and often literally in terms of just the news that's available and the, you know, the quality and quantity uh, just uh, diminishing. Meanwhile, from an activist standpoint, sustaining a local peace center, sustaining organizations that are 
whether it's fashionable or not, whether there is negativity directed at it or not, continues to assert that diplomacy is better than bombing people and that there is negotiation as a process that leads people and countries to find, if not perfect solutions, at least a different way of relating to each other than threats and military action. Right now, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, as this year comes along, I'm, I'm personally also excited about Daniel Ellsberg Week. I think that it's not only crucial to keep Daniel Ellsberg's legacy alive as somebody who um, can be ignored by mass media, but to reinvigorate what he was all about and so many other people have been about. A quick anecdote, we at the Institute for Public Accuracy and Roots Action took 535 copies of the Doomsday Machine Mm -hmm. and hand-delivered them to every member of the House and Senate's office in Washington, D.C. with personal letters from Daniel Ellsberg, not just Dear Senator, but Dear Senator Jones, Dear Senator Smith. Mm -hmm. And there were many times when I walked into the office of a congressperson, was greeted at the desk, the front desk, by an employee who worked for that congressperson, And I would say, oh, here's a book and a letter for Congressperson Jones from Daniel Ellsberg. And guess what I would hear? Wow. I'm not familiar with that name, Daniel Ellsberg. (laughs) Yeah. And so this is a great example. These are people who work in the United States Congress. Right. So all the more reason that we, and this is part of the quest, we're going to have vigils, demonstrations, teach-ins yes. between uh, June 10th and 16th. Anybody can find out more by going to defusenuclearwar.org. That's defusenuclearwar.org. One of the many things people can do is go to city councils for proclamations. They can also go to the relevant agencies and commissions and say, we want to name Daniel Ellsberg Library. We want to name Daniel Ellsberg Elementary School so that it won't be so easy for those who want to erase who he was to just shunt aside the tremendous work that he has done. Well, actually, when we signed up to support Daniel Ellsberg, we, there was a great list of different things that we can do. And just because I said we're going to go to Northrop Grumman, that's not necessarily <laughs> the only thing we're going to do. So Wonderful. We'll see what, what else we can do. But uh, definitely, you know, um, helping, you know, just one of the things I think people just helping to get our friends and neighbors aware just keep talking about these things we even you know and and building you know the common ground even you know i know a lot of times people think oh with we're coming from two different places but there's a lot of overlap and then if you can get people to see some of the overlap then they can sometimes start to see what some of the points we're making and how it relates to their personal lives and you can repackage these points um and translate them into a slightly different language called conservative, right? Mm -hmm, Um, Sure. And stop focusing on the ethics and start focusing on the economics. Oh, and the economics. We were just talking about this. The economics are in there Because there are so many many arguments we could use, we need to tailor them to the audience that's in front of us. Always. And then the most difficult part is to actually talk to... um, People who support fascist movements like MAGA, right? Because that's the only hope. Is you know, and 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 when you talk to them, you find out that they have many of the same grievances and many of the same hopes. Exactly. And it's just a matter of packaging this into, you know, this is this is healthy. So you know, I'm going to say it, I can't. I, I'm sorry to say that we're almost out of time. So. I mean, I really only have time. I would like to give you final words, but so let's take those as the final words of some of the things that we can do and then use our imagination, um, you know, and work with each other, try to be the change. But I, I, first of all, I just need to take the time to thank you both so much. Well, Mike, right here, and Norm, 
we just can't thank you enough for really all you do. We really appreciate you coming and joining us on the show today. Yeah. Well, many, many thanks to you both. I just appreciate what you're both doing. It's just uh, keep on keeping on because that's what it's about. Well, we're going to do that. And with your, your inspiration, your, your um, insights and inf- inspiration make it so much easier because you've done so much and you continue to do so much. So we can't thank you enough. And if we get a Daniel Ellsberg Avenue in Buffalo, um, that's on you, Norman. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, for that yeah. Idea. yeah, yes. yeah that's, we'll be working on that. So thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. This is Talking Peace. And together we've been Talking Peace in truth and love. Thank you so much. We did it.